Let's see if I got this right. All right, guys, if I've got this right, I uh, hope it's working. Uh, second attempt since I already blew it once. Hey, this is Dr. Farrell. Um, I'm making this presentation for our patients uh, in our South Riding and Reston offices in the Farrell Pediatrics office, just because I feel like I've had this conversation with a lot of folks, because um, I know there's a decision coming up for parents and uh, I'll try and get this out there so that you can see my considerations for uh, return to school um, and uh, for you know, you guys to think about as you make these decisions. Um, in our county, uh, it looks like we have two different options. I think you guys are familiar with these, the distance learning 100% DL. Um, so I'll be referring to it as DL and then the hybrid choice, which is two days in school and three days DL. Now, um, uh, I think you know the first consideration for you guys is you know is returning to school safe. Um, there are multiple guidelines put out by Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, University of Massachusetts, done by Harvard, um, the uh, American Academy of Pediatrics that I've used to review for this. I can give you references if you need them, um, but I'm going to divide this kind of very quick discussion into kids under 12, kids over 12 what we need to do to keep it safe, and then just how difficult it is for our school administration and school boards. So folks, the masks, the distancing, the ventilation, testing and tracing considerations. I think if, if all five of these are in place and working, I think we can return to school safely. And this is a big if. And I wanna say these are major, major considerations. Your school administration is doing a, a yeoman's job, a very difficult uh, set of decisions and your school board is working very hard to make this work. So um, I just want to harken back to Dr. Williams and his school administration making a decision to close schools back in March. That's a very difficult decision to make. We look back on it now as if it's kind of matter of fact, but uh, hey, they were heroic back then. Let's give them some time to guide, guide us through this uh, right now. Um, so quickly about age differences. So kids under 12, uh, some pretty exciting data uh, coming to the forefront, and this is going to be from various countries that did this before us. So it seems that our children are uh, under 12, have a smaller lung volume. Uh, because of that smaller lung volume, they do not make as many large droplets, which is the way this goes, uh, or the way that this spreads from person to person. Um, and under consideration for investigation is how much of a viral load they create. And some early preliminary data shows that they create less of a viral load. Um, there's also evidence of much milder disease in children under 12 and markedly less secondary attack rates, um, both in families and schools. So secondary attack rate, that's what we really all want to know is when one child gets sick, how likely are they to give it to another child or to an adult? And even within a family structure, we're seeing when they live together, there's very little secondary attack and schools that have opened in Australia, Ireland, France, and uh, Denmark have had uh, over 2,000 close contacts with a child who was the primary sick patient, and they have had no secondary cases in children under 12. And although that's not necessarily a huge number, that is not what we would expect with something like the stomach flus that we're all familiar with or influenza. So this is where you're seeing the data that children are not driving this disease. Again, doesn't mean they can't. It has happened. Uh, there was a single case in, in South Korea where a fifth grader gave it to another fifth grader. And they know that because their testing and contact tracing is quite vigorous. Um, so they do need to be masked. But this is the reason for the three foot rule, especially those two factors up front. Quick little word about masks. Again, one of the things that I, I always am trying to adhere to during COVID time is studies, not stories, because stories can be misleading. They can be anecdotal, oftentimes used to stoke fear and misunderstanding. Um, but kids can 
comply with the mask rule. And I know this is gonna be difficult, but I think if we as adults emulate the right behavior, that is a three-year-old from our practice who I got permission to take a picture. And right when I was about to take it, her dad said, give them deuces. And she gave me the, the sign and she's just cute as a button, but she's three and kept it on the entire time she was in the office with me. Now I know that's a lot less than what's required at school, but the little girl on the left or on the right um, has an amazing story. She was unfortunately trapped in India. She went there for her one-year-old birthday party um, at the end of February and could not return for a few weeks past the time they were scheduled to come back. So her mom was left with this difficult decision of how do I get this little girl back safely? And so she desensitized her. Um, basically every day for longer periods of time, she just had her wear the mask. And this young lady sat there for 20 minutes during her 15 month old checkup and did not take that mask off. So if we can emulate and we can really make a cultural change, our kids will comply. <laughs> this little girl was amazing to me. So I know not all children have the same personalities of my three. I can pick the one that's gonna take his mask off if he were younger. But again, it's one of those things where if we just constantly harp on it, kids can adapt. Um, let's talk a little bit about our older kids. So the older kids, once they hit puberty, it increases their lung volumes. They do have large droplets that may have the potential to go farther. Still under research is maybe because of fewer ACE2 receptors, do they have less viral load? Major study out of Germany that came out that's being picked apart by academic uh, doctors. And so I'm waiting for the results. I will update you as I know. There is dramatic evidence of transmission without precaution. So locally, we had a group of teenagers that went to Beach Week. And um, let me just say their social distancing was measured in, um, in uh, microscopic uh, feet rather than, than, than six feet distance. So again, without the precautions in place, in place, we do know that older kids can transmit this disease. That's quite obvious. So that's just what's going to make um, masking and distancing very, very important in our middle and high schoolers. Um, but again, still, when we're looking at secondary attack rates, they're lower than what we're seeing as adults. Now, for parents with children with uh, potential issues, I want to look at the CDC risk factors. And what we're looking at here are, are risk factors that may apply to children or teenagers that would make them at higher risk. When we see who gets sick, who ends up in the ICU, who ends up having a bad outcome, here are the factors. And these are the, the very top of the, of the list of risk. Number one, body mass index greater than 30. So folks, this is changeable. This is something where we have a summer before the kids go back. So let's work on getting that number down. Related to that typically is type two diabetes, not always. So if your child has type two diabetes, controlling that through both diet and potentially medication and working with your endocrinologist. Developmental disorders are listed. They included ADHD, cerebral palsy, trisomy 21. Uh, exploring that further, the patients with ADHD, there's a certain subtype that's very impulsive and probably cannot um, obey or, or maybe having difficulty with obeying some of the masking policies. Cerebral palsy, trisomy 21, obviously developmentally delayed at times and may have difficulty with this. Cerebral palsy patients sometimes struggle with struggle with secretions. So I know this is going to be a specific consideration for parents whose children have those. When we're talking about chronic, chronic kidney disease, it's listed. We're talking about patients on dialysis. We're not talking about a young lady who's had two or three urinary tract infections. So this is something that um, is really the extreme case of almost kidney failure. Immunocompromised due to organ transplants. So if you've had a kidney replaced or a cardiac transplant, and we do have some patients in our practice with that, um, that is is definitely an increased risk factor. Sickle cell disease and cardiomyopathy, which is a very rare either congenital or post-viral occurrence where the heart is damaged. So this does not include con congenital, most other forms of congenital heart disease. So we're thankfully not seeing that. So this is the list in front of me that I would say creates very high risk. And the patients who are in these categories should strongly consider distance learning. There's also a list of maybe risky. So let's talk a little bit about what that may be. Um, the first one is asthma. Now, 
asthma in adults that is non-allergic has been shown to potentially be a higher risk factor. Um, we are not seeing this in our pediatric patients and we're not seeing it in our adolescents. This is still going to be under investigation. So if you have asthma and it's, un it's under good control, very mild intermittent asthma, we are not seeing that as a risk factor. And I would say that that includes the majority of, the, of our patients. So I would not say that is a reason definitively to go DL. Type one diabetes might be a risk factor again, can be controlled. I know everyone's looking at their hemoglobin A1Cs, checking in with your endocrinologist. Um, I would say the same thing about patients with cystic fibrosis or patients with rheumatologic conditions. I think these are things where you would defer to your specialist, give them a call, talk through this with them. Uh, patients with rheumatologic conditions or patients on chemotherapy do have increased immunocompromised uh, status and need to be cautious. Thalassemia is a blood dyscrasia and then smoking and vaping is also something that needs to be looked at as changeable. Uh, next, are the school buildings safe? Ventilation. So this is something that I know our school administrators and engineers are pouring over data regarding the safest ways to keep the viral load down. So we may need to sacrifice comfort for safety. Folks, as you make this decision, the school buildings may be running hot this fall because if we bring in more, more fresh air, it's going to reduce the risk of transmission. That means that our air conditioning will not necessarily be as comforting as it's been in the past. And so for both teachers and kids, you need to make this decision knowing that it may be uncomfortable. Um, the data is still being evaluated on buildings and there will be variability in Loudoun County Public Schools. I don't know where that is published, but it is a conversation that needs to be had is what's the difference between say Mercer that was built first versus Champ or Freedom or any one of our local elementary schools from Little River all the way to the more recently uh, built schools. And so are there gonna be differences between ages? Have they had their HVAC systems inspected? Are the seals on the filters um, viable? So um, testing, really quickly, since this is geared to our practice, we should have the SOFIA 2 rapid antigen test in our offices soon. It's a 15 minute test result. It's got 87% sensitivity. That's about as good as it gets right now, folks. So I do feel like before schools open, we need to make sure that testing is vigorous and available. And I hope that our administration will be flexible and we may need to convert everybody to DL if, if we go through a shortage. We cannot go into the school system flying blind like we were in March and April. Um, and then contact tracing. I think this is something you need to consider as a parent because it is the responsibility of our health department to contact trace. But my fear is without automatic tracing, a single case could go far in high schools. So if you do choose to put your child into a, uh, a hybrid situation, do know there is consideration of using some type of automatic tracing, which would generally be th through a cell phone. So again, these are one of those things where we may need to sacrifice you know, certain, certain things to make sure that we are safe. Now, the, uh, the systems that I've looked at are not allowing any private information to be transferred, just contact traced. Um, going to switch gears here and talk about education for a second. First thing I need you guys to figure out, or I, I advise you guys to figure out is how does your child learn? We all learn differently. In general, there can be a big difference between the sexes. Being a guy myself, I tend to be a visual and tactile learner and less so auditorily. Um, and so, and a lot of my male colleagues follow suit. Um, but of course, there are women who learn that way and men who learn uh, uh, auditorily. So this is where you need to know how your child learns. Um, it may be something that you want to read about, investigate, or talk to past teachers who may know your child much better than I do. Um, in general, amongst the, the three big ones, auditory, visual, and kinesthetic, I was going to say, we need help. Um, I want my educators to chime in. If you guys have some websites or some resources for our parents to look at as they make this decision, feel free to forward to them. A community board uh, could be created, something like that. So we have all these resources in one place. Um, the Dulles South Coronavirus Outreach Team, maybe we can get something put up so parents can go there. My opinion, and again, I want educators to jump in because I'm, I'm stepping outside of my expertise, but auditory learners may do quite well with a DL format. Our visual learners will need some help from our educators. How do you convert auditory to visual? It could be something as simple as taking notes while you're listening to a lecture because that converts it to visual and tactile. And then kinesthetic, those, those students may do better in class, especially the hands-on types. Um, so again, this is where I'm going to need a lot of assistance, but I think each of you needs to consider each individual child separately with these considerations. 
Um, lastly, homeschooling. Should you homeschool? Very personal decision. I don't know what to tell you, but I do know there are resources out there. To the left is Dr. Alice Marr. She has the brain of that gentleman to the right who's fictional. Alice is real life. She's a pediatrician, a mom of three. She's worked for us for a few decades and she is a homeschooler. She is a speed reader and digests books of 800 pages and in hours and she is massively intelligent. I asked her to come up with a list for our, our patients. And if you go to our website, either South Riding or Feral Pediatrics and go to the search bar and just go to homeschooling, up comes a resource. She's got little vignettes about each website. And so even those of you who aren't homeschooling, I think this will be a good resource for you. And again, educators, you can add to it if you've got anything for our, for our parents to help them out. Because uh, I think in essence, all of us will be doing a bit of homeschooling. So um, parting thoughts, I think um, this is obviously a difficult decision for all of us. You have a dedicated school board administration that is working very hard to make this as safe as possible, but there will never be no risk. Um, but we are at least a year away from a vaccine and there's the worst case scenario that the vaccines are not effective, which um, is always a possibility. So we have to learn how to do this the best. We are seeing more mental health issues than medical issues in our current office. I would say that we've seen crises that are quite alarming. And so I think our schools are an incredibly huge part of our community. Uh, I think I knew that before and I certainly know it now with even three months without school, some of our students are suffering greatly. Um, and so for our community, we need to do whatever we can to make sure that this is safe. Um, and again, um, lastly, I think you have to look at your nuclear family, and this is obviously a big deal. Do you have an older relative living at home? Do you have somebody who's immunocompromised? Obviously, that's going to send you toward the DL, but if you have a nuclear family that does not have any high-risk individuals in it and your children themselves are not high-risk, I do feel like the schools uh, with these parameters in place can be a safe place for them to return and find that balance between good mental health, educational health, and physical health. Um, feel free to send any questions to us, and thank you for listening.